Welcome to Street Talk, S&P Global Market Intelligence podcast that offers listeners a deep dive into issues facing financial institutions and the investment community. I'm Nathan Stovall, and in this episode, we're talking about higher rates, which are generally a good thing for banks. But here we're talking about how the sharp move upward has left most institutions' bond portfolios underwater and also complicated some deal discussions. When it comes to bond portfolios, the change is just an accounting entry. Most bonds banks own sit in their available for sale portfolios, which they must mark to market on a quarterly basis, and those swings don't impact income. They do, however, impact tangible book value, and investors have paid close attention to it, given the huge swing that we've seen in rates. By the end of the second quarter, the average 10-year yield was 98 basis points higher than in Q1, and 140 basis points higher than in the fourth quarter. The average five-year yield was 104 basis points higher than in Q1 and 170 basis points higher than in Q4. Big swings indeed. The pressure that put on bond portfolios and the resultant impact on tangible book value has been pretty noteworthy. In fact, it's even complicated some deal discussions since buyers have to mark sellers loan portfolios to market at closing as well. We even heard from Piper Sandler Director Joe Regan at our Community Bankers Conference back in mid-May, just a few months into the move, that higher rates were already altering the M&A process. And lately we've seen, especially this year with where rates have gone, we've seen a lot of headaches around purchase accounting. Fortunately, I didn't start as an investment banker back in the day when pulled accounting was, was still used much simpler <laughs> back in the day. But gap purchase accounting now with, with, with you know, how you mark a, a, a seller's tangible common equity to fair value, where rates have gone, there's a lot of really punitive asset marks. And so we've seen a couple of instances and in transactions where pricing couldn't get to a consensus between two parties because if you, had a, if you had an acquirer that was willing to pay two times tangible book for a seller and after applying marks, the fair value of what they were buying, tangible common equity, had dropped to a level where now that implied multiple was 230 or 240 a tangible book, right? The economics that we all focus on, like dilution and earn back um, and earnings accretion, start to move away from everybody. So purchase accounting has become a real issue. AFS marks in bond portfolios, trapped in AOCI. All of this, you know, you can't ignore when you're modeling and, and trying to price a deal. And certainty of closing, obviously, you know, closing is a future event. Um, so it's inherently uncertain. And you could close in an environment four, five, six months from now that's totally different than today. Since mid-May, the issue has gotten more pronounced. It seems clear that higher rates are here to stay, with the Federal Reserve aggressively tightening monetary policy to combat elevated inflation. The Fed's also reiterated several times that it remains committed to getting inflation under control and will do whatever is necessary to do so. At the same time, As bond portfolios have remained deep in negative territory, we've heard some investors express fears that banks might have to ultimately recognize unrealized losses in their bond portfolios to meet some of their liquidity needs. And that issue's gotten more play as we saw deposits decline in the second quarter from the prior quarter. We think that banks would look to other funding sources first before engaging in loss trades, but it's definitely on the radar of some investors. Warren C., who covers banks at S&P Global Market Intelligence, has written about how rates have impacted accumulated other comprehensive income, or AOCI, and covered how those changes have impacted bank strategies and, in particular, slowed M&A activity. Warren, as we saw rates spike late in Q1, we saw AOCI move in negative territory, and, and that trend definitely weighed on tangible book value across the industry. What did we see happen in the second quarter? Yeah, in the second quarter, we continued to see an uptick in unrealized losses. You know, I heard a lot about this on first quarter earnings calls, and our data showed that the industry recorded $170.2 billion in AOCI losses in Q1. And then Q2, we saw $253.4 billion in losses. And this is a widespread issue among the majority of banks only 66 banks in the second quarter posted a quarter-over-quarter improvement in their AOCI levels, and only 53 posted a year-over-year improvement. And like you said, these losses have really weighed on tangible book value, with a majority of banks posting both quarter-over-quarter and year-over-year declines in their tangible book values in the second quarter. In the second quarter, only 1,300 banks posted improvements in their tangible book value quarter-over-quarter. That's pretty incredible, but perhaps not 
and surprising when you think about the way banks invest. You know, they look at their investment portfolios, and large part is 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 a source of liquidity, and and you see pretty similar investment approaches across the f- space. So, I mean, the, the real takeaway is that it, it's pretty widespread. And I know you spoke with a number of advisors, uh, investment bankers who are talking with banks on this this issue. Because it's so widespread and you know, not just unique to a small group here, has it impacted how buyers think about deals, the way they're valuing banks? And, and if so, what are they really struggling with? So I talked to a couple investment bankers, and ultimately it's not – impacting deal appetite too much, but it is weighing on negotiations, especially for buyers who who really are trying to get their hands wrapped around what a seller's true tangible book value is. I talked to Matthew Resch, who is a managing director at PNC, their FIG advisory group, and he's the co-head of M&A and capital, capital markets. He said that these this AOCI noise and how it's weighed on tangible book value is making it very tough for buyers to determine a seller's true tangible book value. Ultimately, these are just paper losses and eventually it will reverse. But, you know, until then, these changes in tangible book value are drastic and they're impacting dilution and earn back period. And it's really weighing on both negotiations and deals that were announced prior to or right when rates started rising. I think that generally, as you know, right, deal, 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 any deal activity is certainly slower this year than mm-hmm. in previous years, and I think that that's one of the big reasons. I mean, there's numerous factors at play, but I think that those AOCI concerns are significant. You know, anecdotally, I can tell you that we've had a number of uh, a, a number of transactions that we're working on, and that's uh, that, that's one of the hot button issues, right? It's mm-hmm. it's what how how can we do it our arms wrap around what is real tangible book value we need to know what real tangible book value is because that's going to play into the deal math around tbv dilution earn back period etc and that's that's a challenge certainly in the current environment yeah and normally when you're modeling a transaction you're looking at it over a longer period of time and trying to say what does the pro forma company look like and you have to make an assumption for the target's earnings the target's tangible book and i wouldn't be surprised if it's the case that you heard that given that we've seen such swift swings in that number, given the rate environment, that it's kind of hard to pinpoint, you know, what's the number we can rely on? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm hearing. And, you know, a good example is Home Bank Shares announced its deal with Happy Bank Shares in September 2021. And Johnny Allison, Home Bank Shares CEO, he's very proud that that deal is triple accretive. But come closing in April, they had to mark the loan book and it was then dilutive to tangible book by 53 cents and had an earn back period of 18 months. And, you know, Johnny Allison on the second quarter earnings call last month, you know, he had some strong opinions about the rate environment and how it's impacting M&A. And it seemed to be that it's weighing on their deal appetite, given the current rate environment. When I think about somebody doing an M&A transaction today, not only have they got to mark the, the bond book, they got to mark the darn loan book. I mean, and, and these people that wrote it 2 and 3 and 3.5%, three and I mean, think about the value of that loan book and what that's going to do. So how in the hell can they pay anything for anybody today in the marketplace? It's gonna, I think it's going to lower... Average price is 150 a tangible book right now. We're still trading over two, but there's only a few of us trading over two times tangible book in the entire United States. So my thought is that that it 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 kind of I guess it's a long old road doesn't turn, but it's pretty interesting to me. Somebody try to sell their bank in this environment based on what they're going to have to do with their AOCI and then what they're going to have to turn around and do on their loan mark. The earn back to tangible book could be 42 and a half years. You know, it just, it just, it's silly to me. I mean, you own, you're going to mark that loan book and these rates now, and that's really going to be pretty disastrous. I mean, I don't know what that will be, what impact that will be, but it, I know what impact it's made on the bond book. So if it makes a similar impact on the loan book, I don't know if M&A can be done. So some buyers like Home and, and, and Johnny, who's who's always been on the prowl for deals and one of the most experienced acquirers around, have, have given some pause to the issue given the headwinds associated with changes in rates. Was that the case across the board? Have we seen some buyers forge ahead? And if they are going ahead, maybe, maybe another way to kind of ask it is, are, are they changing the process 
when they go to communicate a deal to the street? Is this something that they think that they need to at least acknowledge? Yeah, definitely. That that seemed to be the case with everyone that I spoke to, both bankers and investment bankers, when I talked to them about this issue. But when I spoke to Bill Burgess, a managing director and co-head of financial services, iBanking at Piper Sandler, he said that this is more of a headache than it is something that's really discouraging buyers and sellers from what would be a good strategic transaction. And to try to ease some of that pain and uncertainty, he said that he started to do and model loan marks as they prepare to announce a transaction so that the buyer can have just a little bit of a sense of what the impact will be around the time of close. I asked him, you know, is that unusual? And he said, yeah, this I've never done this in the past. It's very unusual, but now it's kind of becoming the norm because of the rate environment and the impact that it's had on valuations of loans and securities. But he said that it's it's really tough because, you know, he said, can you tell me where rates are going to be in the next four to six months? And I said, well, no, I can't tell you. I'm I'm not pal. You know, it's it's hard. They're, they're trying to ease this uncertainty and, and help buyers feel better about striking these deals without knowing where things are going to fall in four to six months time. But but it's tough. More of an annoyance because you have to explain. It's one more thing to explain. And it's kind of like politics. If you're explaining yourself, then you're already losing. You have, you have to. You know, you know talk, talk about the uh, the upside for a transaction, why it makes sense, but not explain why the numbers look a little bit different than you would have expected a year or two ago in, the, in a normalized rate environment. But I, I, I think, um, I, I can't think of a time when we were doing loan marks uh, outside of credit. Credit loan marks are normal. Mm-hmm. Interest rate loan marks are, are, are very unusual. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're becoming more the norm because you saw what a big difference uh, you know, the rate environment has had uh, on on valuations of loans and securities. Mm-hmm. So uh, we're doing it. But the hard part is, can you tell me where, where rates going to be in six months? Right, right. How, how do you how do you predict that future? It, 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 as we heard somebody say at our conference back in May, if you knew the answer to that, then uh, you, you'd probably be on a yacht somewhere in the Mediterranean because you'd have some of the most valuable information around. But one, one of the things, and you would flag this in, in your story, we, we've seen at least you know one bank, one serial acquire Seacoast, Try to talk about it and at least provide the street with a look on what the transaction could look like, inclusive of all those marks, as well as those excluding them. Just trying to give it an idea of what the impact is, at least in a point in time. So you might not be able to say what it looks like on a go forward basis, but you're at least giving the street examples of, look, here's the impact today. Here's the impact of that so-called noise or annoyance, as uh, as Bill put it. Yeah, definitely. And Seacoast, when they put that deal out, you and I were talking, they had a very well-done deck where they gave a lot of detail, not only about the impact of AOCI, tangible book, but just the rate environment in general, but about the, the seller's loan book, things like that. And that's another thing. When I spoke with Ocean First CEO Chris Mayer a few weeks ago, we were talking about the current environment, and I asked him about the impact of the rate environment right now. And he also brought up that just the uncertainty about recession, yes or no, you know, credit quality, it's going to be normalizing. What can we expect? You know, we have rates rising so fast. Buyers have to be extra communicative, not only about the rate environment and its impact on deal math. You have to communicate about, okay, credit quality is normalizing. Is there a potential recession? That's worrying investors. Here's what industries the seller is exposed to. Um, You know, rates are rising this much. Here's how asset sensitive or interest rate sensitive the seller is, things like that. And he said, you know, when you have to communicate all these different things, it just gets to a point where it's too much noise. And that that's another reason that we've seen M&A slow down. Sure. But if you're going to do it, you need to meet investors where they are. We've been writing for some time and, and talking about how recessionary fears are, are playing, plaguing or at least weighing on the group's valuations. You know, we've seen that since since the early spring. So if you're going to go to market, you kind of need to expect that there's going to be that level of uncertainty. The rate piece in the swings that we've seen from AOCI are just one other piece that sort of complicate it. But it sounds like Chris, Seacoast, Bill are kind of recognizing that if you're going to be in this game right now, this is how you need to approach communicating with investors. And if you don't, you, you might get punished for it. Yeah, definitely. I think you summed it up well. So at the end of the day, it sounds like from everyone you've talked to, including a number of acquirers, while some might be on the on the sidelines, those that are forging ahead 
are just looking at this as another consideration rather than completely derailing deals. You know, we've seen a slowdown, sure. Uh, we're on pace, I think, for the last I checked, 168 deals this year, which is down considerably from 215, but it's still 168 deals this this year. So it seems like more part of the game rather than totally pushing people away, or at least some some of the acquires in the space is was was that your takeaway yeah it, everyone seemed to think that it might be keeping some people on the sidelines but ultimately if something is strategic in nature people are, are going to go for it you just have to communicate a little bit more than you would in a more normal environment whatever a more normal environment means nowadays and i was really surprised when i was listening to second quarter earnings calls i heard a couple more banks than i expected saying you know we are on the hunt for deals and we're not going to let this impact our appetite we had community bank system ceo mark Trinisky. he said that right environment is not going to hinder their M&A appetite. Rates go up and down and non-cash things like loan marks, credit marks aren't going to make a difference to, to them. He said that he prefers to value a seller based on their cash flow. Provident Financial Services CEO, you know, he agreed that AOCI losses and intangible book value declines that it's making the M&A environment more noisy and that might change some of the optics of a deal and how the world sees the deal but it's not going to get in the way of a good strategic transaction, he said. Well, great, Lauren. Thanks for coming on once again and uh, taking the time to talk with us. Yes, thank you so much. I I'm glad to be back.